Hey everyone, how's it going? So today I want to talk about something everyone holds near and dear to their heart, commercial airliners. However, we aren't going to be talking about the great joys of checking luggage and being seated next to the man that smells of pickles. Instead, we're going to be looking at an early attempt to create a commercial airliner made nearly 100 years ago in an attempt to push the boundaries of aviation as they knew it. Given that aircraft and aviation technology overall was much more rudimentary 100 years ago, the earliest attempts to create commercial passenger aircraft typically housed just a handful of passengers. One of the earliest attempts, the Ruski Vityaz in 1913, could theoretically house three crew and seven passengers. For the next two decades or so, commercial aircraft would slowly evolve and increase their capacities and flying distances. For example, the Vityaz had a range of about 110 miles, not bad for such an early plane. Six years later, the French F-65 Goliath, with a capacity of four crew and 14 passengers, had a range of about 500 miles. Jump ahead to 1934, we can find something like the ANT-20, one of the largest transport planes of its time, with a capacity of eight crew and 72 passengers, and a range of about 750 miles. Of course, the ANT-20 was at the very top of the scale in terms of size, so something more practical and common from around the same time would be something like the DC-3, with a capacity of two crew and 32 passengers. I'll stop there to not be too repetitive, but you understand how comparatively small airliners, passenger planes, and transport planes were in this era, at least compared to today. With such small capacities, it shouldn't be surprising that the most effective way of moving people was by sea, as large vessels could move hundreds of people with relative ease. But, and hear me out on this, what if we put some wings on a boat? Best of both worlds, right? With the inherent limitations that runways would cause, like the expense of making them, the need for the plane to take off by a specific distance, the plane needing to conform to a certain size, and limited landing places for planes, using the water as a runway instead meant that aircraft designers could make much larger aircraft, free from all those little restrictions. Of course, they were still limited by technology, but still. This then takes us to French-German aircraft engineer Claude Dornier. Dornier had a bit of a thing for flying boats, with his most successful aircraft being the Doe J. Wall, which utilized a rather strange twin engine mounted in a push-pull configuration located at the very top of the plane. This design would see lasting success, being introduced in 1923 and lasting until 1950 as a transport plane. Building upon the design of the wall, Dornier decided to push the boundaries of aviation, making something that seemed to be more fiction than fact at the time. First flown in 1929, this is the Doe X. Measuring in at a staggering 131 feet long, and with a wingspan of nearly 157 feet, the X was far and away the largest plane in existence when it was built. With a max capacity of 10 to 14 crew and 100 passengers, it had a greater overall capacity than the ANT-20 of five years later. With a gross takeoff weight of 108,000 pounds, it outweighed the gross takeoff weight of the ANT-20 by about 16,000 pounds. The X wouldn't be outclassed in gross weight until 1941, when the 140,000 pound XB-19 bomber was made. Being the largest plane in the world at the time it was made, it had a rather interesting propulsion system due to its sheer size. Utilizing the twin engine mounts of the wall, the X had a rather ridiculous looking six twin engine mounts on top of the wings, each outfitted with a Siemens Jupiter nine-cylinder piston engine, with each of those having 525 horsepower. Having a total horsepower of around 6,300 between all 12 engines, this flying whale could fly at a maximum 150 miles an hour and at an average speed of around 110 miles an hour. Due to these engines being rather prone to overheating and the X being incredibly heavy, its maximum altitude was only around 1,400 feet. 
The engines would later be swapped out in 1930 with Curtis V1570 V12 engines, each with 610 horsepower. This would increase the maximum altitude it could reach to around 1,600 feet. Managing these 12 engines was a chore in of itself, as the pilot would have to relay commands via an engine order telegraph to a designated flight engineer who controlled each engine's power individually, as each engine had its own throttle control and own gauges to monitor. This was rather similar to how more standard large ships were controlled, so the X took the idea of a flying boat pretty literally here. I mean, just look at this picture of the engine control room on it. If I didn't know any better, I would have assumed this was taken on a submarine or something. The interior of the plane consisted of three distinct levels, again adding to the image of it basically being an ocean liner with wings. The central main deck is where the passengers were. Outfitted with luxury accommodations like a smoking room, a wet bar, a dining area, and seating or sleeping areas for anywhere between 66 and 100 passengers. Also on this level, towards the front, was a kitchen area, bathrooms, and a cargo hold. On the upper deck was the cockpit, the engine control, navigational office, and radio room. On the lower deck were the fuel tanks and nine watertight compartments that were used to keep the plane afloat when in water. To maintain its balance on the water, out of the bottom jutted two smaller wings that passengers would also use to enter and exit the plane. Being as large and luxurious as it was, the X was the subject of much public fascination and intrigue, and that intrigue became its primary function. As the story goes, on October 21st, 1929, the X with 10 crew, 9 stowaways, and 150 passengers managed to take off and fly for anywhere between 40 minutes to an hour. Allegedly, the passengers were asked to stand on one side of the plane or the other to help it make turns. This flight set a record that would not be broken for the next 20 years, the most people carried on a single flight. Continuing its journey for publicity, on November 3, 1930, the X took off from Frederikshafen, Germany on a transatlantic flight to New York. The X would make several landings across Europe in the process, stopping in the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, France, Spain, and Portugal. Unfortunately, an incident involving a tarp and one of the engine's exhaust pipes led to the left wing catching fire on November 29, 1930, leading to it being stranded in Lisbon for about six weeks while it was repaired. After this delay, the plane would make its way along the African West Coast, reaching Cape Verde by June 5, 1931, before then flying over to Brazil and eventually reaching New York on August 27, 1931. It would then remain in New York for the next nine months as the engines went through extensive repairs before finally flying back to Berlin, landing there on May 24, 1932. While on this adventure, two more X's were made, the X-2 and X-3, each purchased by Italy. Each plane was slightly different from the original, using Fiat A22R engines, each with 570 horsepower. These planes, much like the original, were mainly used for publicity stunts and attention. While these three planes were of great interest to the general public, their flight careers just sort of fizzled out, largely due to accidents. The original X suffered significant damage in 1933 after the tail was torn off during a particularly steep and rough landing. It would eventually be moved to a German aviation museum in 1936. Then, during World War II, the original X was unfortunately destroyed in a British bombing run, with various fragments of it being looted by various people and making their way to various aviation museums. The X-2 would suffer a strangely similar fate, when just a month after the original's tail was ripped off, the X-2 would also have its tail ripped off. Attempts were made to transform both the X-2 and X-3 into military bombers to find some use for them, but these tests largely went nowhere. Both the X-2 and X-3 would then be removed from active use in 1935 and quietly scrapped in 1937. Thus, three modern marvels of the early 30s faded from existence. 
In the end, while the X ultimately failed in becoming a transatlantic commercial airliner or a military bomber in Italy's case, it did ultimately succeed in being a proof of concept, showing that transatlantic commercial flight was possible, just probably not with the technology that they had at the moment. At that time, aircraft engines were often just too underpowered for such large passenger planes. Still though, the X can be viewed as one of the initial stepping stones towards the airliners and air travel that we know today. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and end. So uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, if you liked the video, remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and squish the bell, you know, all that good stuff. If you have any suggestions for future videos, go ahead and put it down in the comments. I have quite a few things that I have plans to make videos on, like a list of like 20 things, but I do welcome any additions you might want to add to it. But anyway, I do hope you liked the video, and at the very least, I hope you learned something. So, alright, see you later.